How are you doing? Dermot Power back here again with another history of Waterford and indeed Ireland and indeed England in this one too. So we're all over the place with this. And it's a story of a young woman whose tragic life and death influenced not only Ireland, England, indeed it influenced the whole of Europe. And she was the talk of Europe at the time. Now, what's uncertain about this young girl is where she was born and where she's buried. A 19th century journal suggests that she was born in Carrick and Shore. Don't know whether it's true or not, that was a suggestion was my. Some people say she may have been, other people say definitely not. But the fact is that nobody knows where she was actually born. There's no evidence. There are two places she could be buried and nobody knows for certain. The story really begins going back to Henry VII. He gave Waterford its motto, which we have to the present day, and that's Herbs Intact to Manish, Waterfordia. And the reason he gave it was because Waterford was a very, very loyal to the crown. And there was a fellow here in Waterford, his name was John Wise, and he was a good friend of Henry VII. So, so much so that he invited John Wise's son, William, over to London to be, live with the royal family and to go to school with him. John Wise became great friends with Henry VIII. John Wise eventually came back to Waterford and he became mayor of Waterford. During that period, Henry of Henry VIII, we got three charters, which is an indication of how uh, Henry VIII felt about Waterford. Two of those charters are presently on display in Waterford Museum. Always well worth a visit the museum. Absolutely brilliant place. When Henry eventually dissolved the monasteries, the Wises got all the land belonging to St. John's Priory. Now, with St. John's Priory, it's down at the back of the, the nightclub Masons. And they all own all that land from there, going right out, taking in Barrick Street, out as far as King's Meadow. And there's a place out there, we know, called the Manor of St. John. Well, Prayers Knock, we all know Prayers Knock where it is, or by Conley Place, it will be known as Prayers Knock. That's all the land that belonged to the Manor of St. John. And the Wises owned all that. And they probably own a lot of it to the present day. What a lot of people don't know about Anne Boleyn is that she was related to the butlers here in Carrick. So how was she related to him? Well, her grandmother was a butler from Carrick. Her father was the Earl of Carrick. They got the title in 1315 when we see the first Earl of Carrick and Ormond being created. Everybody thinks immediately of the butlers in Kilkenny Castle, but the one in Carrick was there before that. In 1315, in actual fact, the butlers built that castle in Carrick and uh, the one in Kilkenny was purchased at a later stage by the butlers. Anne's grandmother married a Thomas Boleyn. Uh, he was a, a wool merchant, a silk merchant in London. And through that, they claimed the title. Her son, Margaret's son, that would be the father of Anne Boleyn, Thomas Boleyn. Uh, when, the, when the Earl of Carrick and Norman died, uh, there was two claimants to the title. One was a butler. His name was Pierce Butler. Uh, he was known as Pierce Rua. Rua being the Irish for red, so he obviously had red hair. So Pierce Rua Butler and uh, Anne Boleyn's father, Thomas Boleyn, claimed the title. So what was to be done? Because both of them had a claim and Margaret was genu a genuine butler. That was the Anne Boleyn's grandmother. So anyway, Henry VIII decided to settle it. And whilst the settlement was, they would get Anne Boleyn to marry the son of Pierce Rua Butler, thereby bringing the two families together and essentially sharing the title. But Anne Boleyn was having none of it because she was in love with Lord Henry Percy, the elder son of the Earl of North Humberland. So that went by the wayside. But what happened anyway, in 1521, Anne was recalled from France in order for this marriage to go ahead. She had been a lady in waiting to the Queen Consort of France. and uh, But she was there for about three years anyway. And she got a job as lady in waiting to the Catherine of Aragon, the wife of Henry VIII. So after a while, Henry began to notice this beautiful little, little girl and she flitting around uh, the palace. He was determined that he'd have her. And why did he want to have her? Well, there was two reasons. One was because already he was after having her sister as his mistress, and now he was going to essentially keep it in the family and have Anne as his mistress. 
but I said she was having none of it because she was deeply in love with Lord uh, Henry Percy. Henry VIII got rid of Percy out of the way. So he followed Anne and Anne, but she refused to be his mistress. She wanted more. Henry then knew that the only way he could have her was to marry her. He appealed to the Pope for permission for an annulment of his marriage based on an old biblical saying. You see, Henry VIII was Catherine of Aragon's second husband. She was she had been married to the uh, Henry VIII's oldest brother, Arthur. He was to be king, but he died. So Henry VIII then became king and he married the, the widow of his brother. That seemingly was against the Old Testament. So he appealed to the Pope. The Pope still wouldn't go with it. They came up with a brilliant idea that they would, Henry, who was a very, very good Catholic, would be head of the Roman Catholic Church in England. So thereby, <clears throat> they packed the Act of Supremacy and Henry took over and got the Archbishop of Canterbury to give him a, a divorce. And so he married Anne. I love finding out the way people looked, you know, how did they dress? What type of food did they eat? And I was successful in finding out exactly how Anne Boleyn looked and what she ate. Now, she was an unbelievably talented young girl. She was a great poetess. She played numerous instruments, spoke many languages. She played the harp. She played the lute. She played the virginals. That's a, a kind of a, like a keyboard. She was a brilliant dancer. And she was well known uh, for the type of moves that she made. Kind of like a Tudor Michael Jackson. She had all these unique and unusual moves and they were copied all over the place so i have a description here of how anne dressed when she was in the court in france and some believe it so excuse me while i read it she had a cape of blue velvet trimmed with points at the end of each hung a little bell of gold she wore a vest of blue barred with silver and a surcoat of watered silk lined with miniver that's a fur uh, her little feet were covered with blue velvet brodequins. They're sort of like ankle boots. The insteps were adorned each with a diamond star. Or on her head, she wore a plate. You will often see lots of people wearing these. They're fairly common now, very much so, in the 60s. And from that was some sort of plated gauze. And her hair fell around her shoulders in ringlets. Now, you won't see that in the portrait, you see, of Anne Boleyn. But you definitely will see him in, uh, in that description in if you ever came across one from France. She always wore hanging sleeves to cover her, uh, her hands. They say about Anne Boleyn, she was in stature rather tall and slender, with an oval face and black hair, and a complexion inclining to sallow. One of her teeth was protruding a little bit. Years ago when I was young, someone like that, they called it a buck tooth, but there you go. She also had a malformation of the finger, which suggested like, she had a six finger, but it wasn't actually a finger. It was just a deformity son. Now, the next thing I came across was the type of food that they ate in the ladies-in-waiting had and the type of allowances they were allowed. And I'd have to read this because I don't want to miss any. It's absolutely brilliant. Now, at the time I'm speaking about, if a peasant was hungry and he went out to the king's forest and caught a rabbit or killed a deer, for that... He wouldn't be fined or anything like that. He'd be hung. And that was the sentence for feeding yourself in the King's Forest. In common ground you could do it, but in the King's Forest you were in big, big trouble. So while a lot of the ordinary peasants were very hungry, perhaps some of them starving, this is how well fed Anne Boleyn was and her friends. Now, first of all, they had an allowance of a, a servant and a spaniel, a you know the small little spaniel to see. They had one of those. Uh, they had the sustenance they had was not only to the lady herself, but also her retainers. That means and servants and any other ones that she had around her. A chine of beef, a manchet. Now a manchet was a loaf of the finest of flour. A chet loaf. That was a loaf of second class flour. They also got a gallon of ale. They also had hens, pigeons and rabbits. On fast days, which would have been on Fridays, they were supplied with salt salmon, salted eels, whiting, garnet, 
place and flounders and they had their own area for eating. Now it is said that Anne Boleyn was extremely like her sister Mary. Perhaps that's what attracted Henry to her in the first place. But the thing about Anne Boleyn, she was one of those uh, women that it was her wit and her talent. That's where her attractiveness lay. Now, when Henry was uh, given his divorce, Anne and himself got secretly married. In June 1533, the heavily pregnant Anne Boleyn was crowned Queen of England at a lavish cer ceremony. She adopted the white falcon as her symbol, and that was from her grandmother's crest, because she seemed to have been proud of her butler lineage. On the 7th of September 1533, Anne Boleyn had a little baby girl, which later became the famous Queen Elizabeth I. Towards the end of 1535, she became pregnant again. And in January 1536, Anne was in the court one day and she was passing a room and she heard some laughing and giggling, opened the door, went in to find a young girl sitting on her husband, Henry VIII's knee, and he kissed him and caressed her. She went into hysterics. Henry followed her. She burst out of the room, inconsolable. Henry followed her and said, listen, listen, forget about it, forget about it. There's nothing going on. But there was a lot going on. Because three months later, the girl sitting on Henry's knee was queen and Anne Boleyn was dead. Interesting thing about that episode is that she eventually miscarried. She went into premature labour after that uh, event. When Henry found out about it, instead of going in consoling his wife, he said to her, what have you done with my boy? Because it was a baby boy she had. What have you done with my boy? Up jumped Anne and said to him, it's all your fault. It was your fault that I miscarried. And he walked away muttering, and as he was going out the door, he turned around and ominously said to her, you'll have no more boys from me. So it was there and then it was contrived to get rid of Anne Boleyn. There was all his advisors, Cromwell, was he got together and they came up with an idea to accuse her of adultery. They got some evidence. They got a musician called Mark Smeaton and they tortured him. And they tortured him into confessing that he had had sex with, with Anne Boleyn. And also named other people. So there was four or five of them, including Anne's own brother, who was very close. The problem with Anne Boleyn was this, was that she was very, very, she was always very, very popular. And she loved going around, being complimented and mixing up with the gallery, I suppose is a good old water way of saying it. Blackguarding with the fellas and the wands and, they, and she didn't act as befitting a queen. And therein lay the problem. Now people were shocked at the way Anne Boleyn behaved because she used to have people, her brother and the musician Rax Wheaton, come up to her room. That didn't go down well at all. So they all, they, they all were tortured anyway. And like her brother never admitted that he had any sexual relations with his sister, most unlikely. So it was decided then that she would be executed. When she was in jail, she behaved, they say she behaved more like a queen in jail than she did in the court. She was ordered for execution to be executed on the 19th of May. And Henry decided that she would be beheaded. And he got an expert swordsman from France to do the job with a special sword called a Calais sword, extremely sharp sword. She was brought to the place of execution, which was uh, in the Tower of London. Now, in the Tower of London, there's, a, there's an area pointed out where Anne Boleyn was, was executed. It wasn't there. It's a green up to the church in Tower of London is where Anne Boleyn was executed. She was obviously very, very nervous on the scaffold and she refused to have a blindfold. The executioner was there with a sword at the ready and every time he moved, Anne turned this way, turned that to look at him. So he got very frustrated. So he motioned to someone to make a noise. And so Anne, we say to the left, she looked to the left. And as she looked, he gave her a swipe of the sword and took off her head. A bystander observed that when the executioner took up the head, as they, they, they always would, and they said this is the head of a traitor or whatever, that her eyes and her lips moved. Now, you might think this is a fantastic story, but I've spoken to people who have been involved in killing animals, 
and that if the head is cut off an animal it's quite normal for the eyes and the mouth to move along with the body independently of each other so it's not a fantastic tale so her eyes and her lips moved Henry VIII provided no coffin for Anne Boleyn there was an old elm chest there that they used to keep arrows in they put her body and her head in that and buried her in a nearby church called St Peter ad Vincula and I hope I pronounced that right but there is a tradition in Norfolk where the Boleyns come from that that night Anne's body was exhumed and brought down to Sally Church in Norfolk and buried there. During the reign of Queen Victoria, she actually had the, the bodies unearthed down below in, in St. Peter at Vincula, and she had slabs laid down and the names laid down, and Anne Boleyn's one is there, and that's pointed out as her place of burial. The tradition down in Norfolk is very, very strong, and there's also a black slab in Sally Church that's also pointed out as the burial place. The only way we'll know is by DNA. That doesn't seem to be happening. I don't know if there's a very big request for it. So anyway, that's the end of poor old Anne Boleyn. And it's, it's a great story. And as I say, Waterford featured in it. And all we can say is about Anne Boleyn. She was one of the butlers in Carrick. You can't say anything better than that. Talk to you soon.